incredible storm, which is at sea. And since the human soul yearns always for peace and that tranquility, I hope that this book would be helped in that direction. That's all I have to say my half an hour of talk. And this is a meticulous person, and the fact that I'm two few minutes late is not my fault. I said, poor Rumi at the end of the world is caught in the labyrinth of the inferno down in the uh, uh, garage here. I couldn't get out of it. It was my apartment <laughs> place, and it's horrible. I was, otherwise, I arrived at the building exactly at 12 o'clock. I will give you a few minutes to ask any questions that you may have. I'd be glad to answer them, and then find the reception. I'll try to sign books for those who want to have books. I also recently, uh, uh, once in a while, do them in poetry. So Mulana's fault. I've been living with him since I said that was five years or seven years ago. Uh, the, the volume of poetry that just come out, which also deals with Rumi, uh, it says the pilgrimage of life in conversation with Rumi. I asked him, Mr. O'Brien, and if it's this year or not there, on this one, traditional studies published it, and there uh, are some copies available there. Anyone who's interested in the poetry also would be glad to sign. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. First off, I guess all religions and all ways struggle between something that's classical and known and ancient and something that is innovative. And I think between those two poles, life exists and life alters. Could you speak about the innovators in Sufism? Because there is classical Sufism and then there are innovators even within that tradition. First of all, I do not accept this dichotomy. It's a question of truth and applying the truth in a particular condition of time and space in which we find ourselves. Every great uh, and uh, authentic Sufi teacher is an innovator. At the same time, it's completely traditional without any innovation because la ilaha illallah is always there, you might say. The oneness of God is always there. The principles are immutable. And uh, uh, creativity in Sufism comes from being able to apply those principles to the conditions in which one finds oneself. Not innovation in the sense of changing the truth. The truth does not change. It's expression and change depending on the circumstances. So you have this very different way of looking at uh, creativity within Sufism and also a permanence and change. We live too much in a world in which originality is uh, prized a great deal. Uh, in Sufism, originality means that which has to do with origin. Originality means to have our roots sunk in the origin. al madda which is God. One of the names of God is al madda in Arabic, the origin. Well, awwal, the first, the origin, the source of the Quran says. So, uh, today in our world, uh, there are a lot of pseudo-Sufi teachers. There are a lot of people with claims far beyond what they really are. But there have been also during the last century or two some very remarkable men and women who lived either in the Islamic world itself or more recently in the West who has message has been completely authentic but applied to the conditions in which they have lived. Not only really the message, the living itself. We had to take, spend three hours on, in the metro of, of Washington to commute between your home and where you're working. The hours you can spend in remembering God must be organized in such a way as to be able to do it. It's very different from getting on your donkey in Ahonia and five minutes down the road is Maulana's house. Uh, so it's not only in message in the sense of writing, but also in practice, in the spiritual life itself. There have, to, there have been created modifications without destroying, in fact, the efficacy of the Sufi practice, the method of practicing spiritual life. Yes, sir. Um, you know, you spoke about uh, two groups or two forces which opposed Sufism in a sense. One was the, what you call the modernist Muslim, and the other the fundamentalist. And for obvious reasons, they would oppose what the Sufi thoughts Sufi traditions uh, present. But, we, and they, you mentioned that they were united in this in some sort of way. Yes, and their opposition to Sufism. That's it. Okay. So there is, a, but with, between them, there is a huge dichotomy. Anyway. Yes, there is. But it's very interesting. So many things, they join forces together, much more than people think. Mm -hmm. First of all, the indifference to Islamic art and architecture. That is, if you raise the ground, uh, like what's happening in Mecca, 
Because while I was in here from a background in which Islamic art was insignificant, it was not important, there was no Islamic art, these people lived in tents until uh, oil was discovered. So there's no sensibility. So the ambience that was created, you were probably from Pakistan in Lahore in the Mughal period, or in Cairo, or in Mamluk period, or in Isfahan during the Soviet period, or in Istanbul during, of course, the Ottoman period, in which the divine beauty was reflected in the world in which you live, is something which is totally irrelevant to both modernists and fundamentalists. The, the, uh, the modernists just want to have big highways so you can get home faster. And the, they're the ones who really destroyed most Islamic cities in, in the 20th century. And the fundamentalists are even worse in a certain sense, because they don't think Islam has anything to do with that whatsoever. Then the question of technology. Uh, technology is really the god of many Muslims. It's not Allah Ta'ala, it's technology. Uh, and a kind of scientism that has swept over the Islamic world. Now, who are its two most ardent followers? The modernists and the fundamentalists. The latest invention in uh, computers, or whatever it is, uh, these walkie-talkies, these things that you have, uh, cell phones and so forth, uh, are used by these two sides. There's no crit criticism of the downside of anything that can help their cause. And thirdly, the question of the spiritual life and Sufism. All that is interiorizing in Islam is opposed by both camps for different reasons. And it's very interesting that both camps speak about Islam, they never speak about God. As if Islam were an end in itself. Islam is the means to Allah Ta'ala, that's why we love Islam. But it's miss submission, but nobody speaks about the reality to which submission must be made. It's in this sense that I said there are two sides of the same coin. Of course, there are immense differences on another level between them, obviously. Yes, ma'am? Yes, um, you make this uh, the, uh, clear connection between Sufism and beauty or the creation of beauty through the music and so on. I mean, I know this sounds very uh, simplistic way I'm putting it, but what was it that actually created this connection? What was it that they were uh, trying to express when they uh, were so creative in all these fields? That's a very good question. First of all, who's attracted to Sufism? It's a person who's usually attracted to God. And in order to reach God, he or she has to embellish his or her soul with virtue. Virtue in Arabic also already means beauty. Mahasan, husn. Husn in Arabic means both goodness, virtue, and beauty. So, in a sense, from the deepest Islamic point of view, to grow in perfection is to become more beautiful inwardly. There's no way of avoiding that. And we often say in every Islamic language, you're like, didn't say in English, that person has a beautiful soul. Why not? When we say as a rational soul, it means quite something else. A beautiful soul is sort of reflecting something of divine jamal, of divine beauty. So quite naturally, all Sufis are attracted to the aspect of divine beauty. Otherwise, they will not be attracted to Sufism. Of course, the aspect of jalal, of divine majesty, is always there. And one of the great errors in the modern world is because of many people bring an aspect of divine beauty without the aspect of divine majesty, which is too difficult. So one in, it's too much too easy to listen to uh, Turkish Molabi music.